Okay, folks, we're back at it again in the Gospel of John, continuing on this journey. Today we're going to look at John the Baptist, and particularly his use of some, call it, first century Jewish hermeneutics when he's asked to indicate who he is by the religious leaders who come down from Jerusalem. So we're going to get into that in a minute, but let me go through a couple of logistical items before we get into the lesson. The first one has to do with Amazon. So for all of you who have been using uh, the Fig Tree Portal to do your shopping on Amazon, we so appreciate that. We appreciate that and we ask, continue on because that definitely helps uh, the ministry. So we thank you for that. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, so Amazon used to have a program called Amazon Smile. And this was a, Amazon had a foundation. So you have a foundation at Amazon. Anybody could go in, find their local church or whatever ministry. And then as you shop on Amazon, the foundation would make a donation. And of course, Fig Tree was part of that. So you could support Fig Tree Ministries while you're doing it shopping. And I know a lot of you use that. Well, Amazon ended up getting rid of that program. They canceled it. And this was back in February of 2023. And so what Amazon suggested to anybody who was on that is to move over to their partnership program. And it's basically like a marketing partnership. What happens then is we have a portal. You enter through that portal. So let me show you here. If you go to our website, figtreeteaching.com, you scroll down on that front page and you'll have a little bit of the explanation of what's going on with the use of Amazon to support the ministry. And right down there at this gray box, it says enter Amazon through the Fig Tree portal. And so what you do, you click on that. And then any shopping you do, it's encoded into the link, will be credited towards Fig Tree Ministries. We're not able to see exactly which items are, have a commission attached to them or not. If it qualifies, it qualifies. If not, it doesn't. But anyways, that's one way you can support the ministry. And like I said, we thank you, everybody who's already been using that link. I've heard from a couple people that what they did was, they went to our website, they clicked on this button, enter Amazon, it, it opens up the Amazon in their computer, and then they save that link that opened up as their main Amazon link. So that way, anytime they go to shop at Amazon, it's automatically attaching that shopping experience to Fig Tree Ministries. So we appreciate that. If you haven't done that, please do it. It definitely helps to share the Amazon wealth with the, any ministry out there or anybody who is attached to this program. And this is coming out right about mid-October. So we're coming up on the Christmas season. Now you can do this year long, it doesn't matter. But coming up on the Christmas season, and we would certainly appreciate any shopping for Christmas done using our portal. Thank you. Now, second one. So what I've been doing is I've been putting together my notes as I'm going through John, and I want to make these notes available to you. And so what I do is something, it looks something like this. I put the text in the middle and then put my notes about what's going on in the text uh, around the edges. You can see the arrows. I also have it hyperlinked so that, you know, if you pull this PDF up on your computer and click that hyperlink, Malachi, it'll take you to a website that'll show you the, the verse that I'm talking about. But this, I think, can definitely help you because, as I mentioned, I think, in the last lesson, John is very dense. He's packing a lot of information. And it would definitely help if you're able to have in front of you uh, my notes of where we're going or what does this mean or what is this pointing at? And that will help you then in your studies to say, aha, I mean, it's just like a commentary, but it's just my notes. And so I don't think I'm going to cover, be able to cover everything that's in these notes, but we might be able to cover a good portion of it. So those are the two things, Amazon and then my notes. And so let's get on to the lesson here on John the Baptist. 
So the question we're asking is, who is John the Baptist? Who does John the Baptist say he is? So when he's asked by the religious leaders who come down from Jerusalem, who are you? John ends up giving them a cryptic answer. He gives them a cryptic answer from Scripture. And actually, what we're going to see today is he's playing with the Scripture. He's playing with the Scripture in a way to apply what's in Isaiah to himself. So he doesn't quote it directly as it's written in Isaiah. He alters the sentence a little bit, but that makes the verse about him. And of course, they know, the religious leaders know exactly what he's doing. So we're going to walk through this in this lesson today, show you what John the Baptist is doing, and show you that this is just considered a normal way for the sages and the rabbis of Israel to derive meaning out of uh, the text. Because we today, you know, you might think, hey, you know, he's not allowed to alter scripture like that. But what he's doing is something that was accepted in that culture. Paul actually does this all the time. He'll take a scripture from Isaiah and he'll alter it a little bit in the New Testament and apply it to Jesus. And part of the reason is that in the original Hebrew Old Testament, it can be, the, the verses can be more ambiguous than we're prepared for. And so, certain verses could be read one or two ways. There might be the more appropriate way, but you could also say, hey, let's, th- or let's read it the other way just to see if we can learn anything. Okay, so this is kind of what John is doing. So let's read the verses that we're talking about first. So this is John 1, 19 to 23, and what's happening is John, John the Baptist, that is, John the Baptist is having a conversation with the religious leaders concerning his identity. So John 1, 19 to 23, just a couple thoughts. What's happening here? So John's ministry is huge. For years after John passed away, he still had disciples following his teachings. So it's having a significant impact. Well, if there's something going on that's having a significant impact, those religious leaders at the temple in Jerusalem, they're going to want to know what's going on. And this is especially true if anybody is hinting that John the Baptist may be the Messiah. Because in the early part of that first century, in Israel, messianic fever was running high. And so there had been other charismatic leaders in the past who'd shown up on the scene claiming to be Messiah. This has been happening, and the temple authorities, particularly because of Rome, Rome and and, and the oppression, the temple authorities, they want to know before a movement gets out of control. Okay, so here's what it says. So starting at verse 19. And this is John's testimony when the Jewish leaders, right, Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, they sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Verse 20, and he confessed and did not deny, but he confessed, I am not the Christ. And then they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. And they said, this is verse 22. They said to him, therefore, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And now John's going to give him this cryptic answer out of Isaiah. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as as Isaiah the prophet said. So the question they're asking, who are you? And he gives... There's, notice there's three people mentioned. There's the, the, the Messiah, the Christ, okay? There's Elijah, and then there's the prophet, okay? So why these three characters? Where are they pulling these from? Well, not the Christ, not the Messiah. And you notice John the Baptist simply offers that information up. He doesn't, he doesn't they don't have to ask him directly. Now, the Messiah, that's the coming king of Israel who's been ordained by God. Many of the Jews there in the first century, particularly the Zealots, they were looking for a military-type 
Messiah, who would help them overthrow the Romans just like that very first Passover when God overthrew the Egyptians. And those religious leaders in Jerusalem, particularly if you've built up your uh, cabal there and you're cozy with Rome and you have your cozy lifestyle, they don't want the masses forming. They don't want to start a war with Rome. Now, by the way, just so you know, by 66 AD, it's exactly what the Zealots did. They drove the country into a war with Rome. But this is the setting of Jesus' ministry and him coming to Jerusalem. So, John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. Okay, what's next? Elijah, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the book of Malachi. And Malachi has a prophecy there at the end that Elijah is going to precede the Messiah. Okay, so he says, look, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, when? When's that going to happen? Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, this is a day of judgment. Okay, verse 6. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So they want to know, are you Elijah? Now, what's interesting is, John the Baptist here says no. Now, he's going to say, he wants them to see that he's the voice from Isaiah. But later, and in other Gospels, Jesus is going to say, no, John is the Elijah that's to come. We know from the beginning of Luke that he's born in the power of Elijah. So, who are you? You're not the Christ, you're not the Elijah, but what about the prophet? Who's this prophet? Where's that reference? Well, this one comes out of Deuteronomy, and it's Moses talking to the Israelites. And Moses says this, he says, The Lord your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you of your brothers like me. Now, prophet, like me is Moses, meaning Moses had direct access to God. God gave Moses words. Moses then spoke them to the Israelites. And if Moses is a prophet of God, what do you have to do? Well, you have to listen to him. And the people didn't want to listen to Moses, right? And so it says right here, you shall listen to him. So if John is the prophet, meaning from Deuteronomy 18, then the religious leaders have to listen to him. And we're going to see this same type of questioning is going to go on with Jesus because they want to know the same thing. Are you getting your information directly from God? Because that means I have to listen to you. Okay, so that's where you get the prophet from. You shall listen to him. So who are you? It's these three characters. We'll see in John, later in John, and we find this elsewhere, these same three people are going to divide the crowds over who Jesus is, right? Remember, at, at Caesarea Philippi, people, uh, Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples are like, some say Elijah, some say the prophet or the or one of the prophets. Some say John the Baptist. I mean, that's strange because John the Baptist had just died. But you can see that people aren't quite sure who is he. He's obviously somebody special. And then it, we'll see in John 7, uh, Jesus is at the Festival of Tabernacles. Same line of thinking. Some in the crowd say, surely this is the prophet. Others say he's the Messiah. So this helps us understand some of the collective thinking. It's not monolithic because there are variations depending on your group and the way you view things. But collectively, the Jewish people are all familiar with these characters. And to varying degrees, they assume that John or Jesus was one of them. Okay, so that's the question. Who are you? Identify yourself. Okay, and then John, he's John the Baptist, that is, he's going to give us a very cryptic answer which when they hear it, they know exactly what he's talking about. And as we read at the beginning, the answer that John's going to give them is from John 1, it's verse 23, and it, he says this. Now, it's really important, it's very important, that when, because we're going to compare this to what Isaiah says. 
it's important to notice where the quotation marks are. Okay? So John replies, he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So John says, look, I'm the voice of one crying. But here he says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, meaning he's placing himself in the wilderness. And then what does that voice that's in the wilderness say? Make straight the way of the Lord. Okay, so notice the quotation marks. Okay, now, now we have to go to Isaiah, because we're going to go look at the original quote from Isaiah. It's in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 3. So there's a couple things that we want to pay attention to here in Isaiah. A lot of the prophetic writings are in Hebrew poetry. And a very common technique within that poetry is parallelism. So two sentences, and they're going to use differing terms that are going to uh, parallel one another. Okay? So for instance, here's what it says, Isaiah 43. A voice of one calling, colon, now the quotation marks, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, let's look for some parallelism, because that will tell us if, they've, if this translation is structured correctly. So, you have wilderness up here, and the comparison, the parallel, is desert. You have the way, and that word in Hebrew, the way, can mean a road or a highway or a path. So you have prepare the, the way, and in the bottom, you're going to have a straight highway. In the fir first part, you're going to have for the Lord, and the second part, for our God. So you can see the first part of the verse, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, is parallel to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, we go back to this, this last question. A voice of one calling. Now, where is that voice located? That's the question that I want to know. Because Isaiah, we assume Isaiah is out of Jerusalem. And so if we assume the voice is coming from Jerusalem, and what the voice is telling you is in the wilderness, almost like you could slide a little go in there. Go into the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Okay, now, one thing we need to know, because we don't live over there, where is the wilderness compared to Jerusalem? Okay, well, let's go to a map. Let's take a look. So, Israel, a strip of land that runs north and south, and there's a ridge line right here inside that red that it's a north-south running ridge line, and this is where almost the entire Bible takes place. This is where the Jewish people lived. Now, over here you have the Mediterranean Sea, that's the blue. So you're down at sea level to the west. It goes up to about 2,700 feet, almost 3,000 feet uh, at Jerusalem. And then it's a precipitous drop-off into an area where the Dead Sea is, and it's 1,400 feet below sea level. So, that's a huge decline. And so, that ridge line blocks all of the rain. You get a ton of rain up in, uh, up in the mountains. You get no rain at the Dead Sea. And they're only a few miles away. Okay? So, if we look over here, you've got the city of Jerusalem and down to Hebron. That's um, on the ridge line. And this is where the wilderness is. We would call it a desert, but wilderness, desert, they're uh, compatible. Okay? So, here's Jericho. That's one of the main towns. We even have that in the New Testament. And, of course, Jerusalem. This is what it looks like. Uh, the, wil the Judean wilderness, just to the east of Jerusalem, as you're driving from Jericho up to Jerusalem. So it's rugged, it's dry, there's nothing out there. Okay? So, what Isaiah is saying is, hey, look, the voice of one crying 
is in Jerusalem is the assumption. And he's saying, go this way, go out into the wilderness to the east, go out there and prepare the way for the Lord. Okay? So you can see what John's doing there. So what I want to do is I want to compare these two. John 1, verse 23, versus Isaiah 43. Okay? So we start, and we, we have to pay attention to those uh, quotation marks. Where, and where is the voice located? Okay? So the top one here, this is John 1, 23, and this is John the Baptist. And he says, I, notice the quotation marks. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So he's placing himself alone in the wilderness, right? And John has grown up in the wilderness. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. That's what the Bible tells us. Even though his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they live up there. Okay? Now, you can see then the quote here. What is the voice of one in the wilderness saying? Make straight the way of the Lord. Okay. Now, let's put up Isaiah. We go to Isaiah, and it says, A voice of one calling. Now pause. What's the voice saying? Notice the quotation mark, and the voice is saying, In the wilderness, prepare the way. For the Lord. So we notice that John is giving a variant reading of Isaiah, and then he applies that variant to himself. Now that's okay, that's normal, but let me just tell you a little bit of a story because this always bothered me. Wait a minute, how can John just change the text like that? Isn't that against the rules, right? I mean, we. We're not allowed to just make an adjustment to the quotation marks of the text to apply it to something else, even though the New Testament writers do it a lot. So when I was in seminary, I kept asking. I was searching for an answer to this. And I would say, what's going on here? You know, and I would go to all my professors and, well, nobody knew. And one of my professors, even, I had asked him, I said, what do you think about this? What's going on here? And he was even a little bit surprised because he hadn't really noticed the difference. Now, it may have been because some of your Old Testaments, like the King James, puts Isaiah in the same structure as it is in John. So, it may be your Bible version, you know, but if you have the NIV, you'll say, ah, there's something different going on here. Now, Part of the issue, again, is that ancient Hebrew doesn't have quotation marks, it doesn't have punctuation like we have today. So it's really, um, it involves the listener or the reader on a much more significant level than we do today. Today we place all of the responsibility on the author. The author who's doing the writing is supposed to make the proper punctuation, have the proper grammar, so that everybody can get the proper understanding. But that's Western culture, because we're a melting pot. So anyways, here's what happened. So all throughout seminary, I'm asking that question. I don't get an answer. Then in my final year, I took a class from a school. It's called the Jerusalem University College, and it's located in Jerusalem. This is a screenshot from their website. Their website is juc.edu. Now, I took a class. And it was on parables. And the class was taught by a Jewish rabbi. Because what we're doing is dissecting and comparing Jesus' parables with the literally thousands of parables that exist in rabbinic writing. Now, the rabbi, Moshe Silbershine, so this was the instructor. And we get to the very first day, and I couldn't even believe this. I mean, I was just, it was one of those moments where you're just like, You're kind of blown away. It was the very first class. It was the very first portion of the class. And he was talking about Jewish or rabbinic hermeneutics. What were the early rabbinic methods of deriving meaning from the Bible? Right? Because parables, Jesus' parables, those are methods to gain an understanding of his Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible. 
I mean, all of Jesus' parables are connecting to something in the Old Testament, and that's one of the hardest things we have is to, we struggle with understanding what he's pointing to. If you check out our series on parables, if you're interested in learning more about parables, you'll see how he's, he's digging deeply into the Old Testament. Okay, back to Rabbi Moshe. Very first example that he provided is what he called in English variant readings. Okay, essentially he's saying the rabbis would read the verse and see if there was any other way they could read it, that they might find a something that also is applicable to life. So these are my notes, by the way, a screenshot of my notes. And I will, I'm going to post these notes if you're interested in them. I'll have them on our website. I'll have a link to them below. But he said, look, how do you punctuate a sentence? How do you read it? You have the leeway to read one way or the other. What's your understanding? Much more flexible than we are today. Again, because they have a common culture which allows them to share a whole bunch of ideas that here in the West we don't do, and so we rely on the accuracy of the author. Now, what does he do? He says, hey, look, there's an example of this from the, from the New Testament. And he mentions exactly this, Isaiah 43, and when John the Baptist quotes that. And so this is what John is doing. He's playing with how you can read the text. Where would you place the emphasis? How would you structure the sentence properly? With quotation marks. And the religious leaders know immediately what John is doing. He's applying the verse to himself by moving the punctuation. Okay? Now, then we'd have to say, what then is John telling us about himself? Okay? And to understand this more fully, we have to then understand something about Isaiah 40. Because Isaiah 40 is an important chapter. Isaiah 40 begins the ending of this very important prophetic book. And the ending goes from chapter 40 to 66. Today, scholars refer to this last part of Isaiah as the book of consolation. Okay? Why? Right here, Isaiah 40 verse 1. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So Israel had been taken into exile because of their sin. They were in exile over in Babylon, and God says, It's time to come home. Comfort, comfort my people, your sins have been paid for. God is going to bring the people back and restore his reign in Jerusalem. And then you get to verse 3 a voice of one calling. Uh, What are they calling? In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay? You're preparing a way for the Lord to come into Jerusalem to rule. And if you look down at verse 5, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all of the people will see it together. The glory of the Lord. That's what John's talking about. It's being revealed in Jesus. Okay? It's a very important chapter. Now, it gets better. Because if you go down to verse 9, this is where we start to hear about the good news. You who bring good news to Zion, there is the good news. Go up high on a mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, you can see what's happening. You're bringing the good news to Jerusalem, and what's the good news? Here is your God. God is arriving into Jerusalem. So I can get to heaven? No. Because God is going to reign. Sovereign power. He rules with a mighty arm. So we have to look at these words, sovereign and rule. The good news is about the kingdom of God. And what we've done over the years, I I don't mean to keep referring to other series that we have, but if you don't know the background to good news and how it refers to kingdom, 
not just being saved or having your sins forgiven. It's kingdom. The kingdom is coming back. God's reign is here right now, and it's available to everybody. Okay? Jerusalem, you're being brought out of exile. You're returning to Jerusalem, and your God is going to reign. The kingdom is at hand. That's what Jesus says. And so, John's mission, what he's telling us is, is he's the voice that is announcing the reign of God who's coming back to Jerusalem. Repent! That's why John's a, his is a baptism of repentance. Get ready for the king to arrive. Get your stuff in order, because the king is coming back. And all of our Gospels represent that the King of Israel, as the Messiah, this is who Jesus, when you get to the end of all the Gospels, and he's hanging on the cross, what's the sign over his head? King of the Jews. God has installed his Son on the throne to reign. This is the message of the New Testament. So this is what John is getting at. It's all about Isaiah 40 and how God is becoming king. But he does it in a way, he's speaking to religious leaders, so he's going to do it through scripture. And they're going to understand what he's talking about. Now, let me give you one last item. It's about this verse in Isaiah. Okay, this is pretty cool. About a hundred years or so prior to, the, to Jesus' birth, there was a group of priests living in Jerusalem, and the temple had become corrupted. And they said, this temple is corrupt. These priests are corrupt. We're out of here, is what they said. We're going to separate ourselves. And what we're going to do is we're going to go prepare the way for the Lord. And we call them today, this is what Josephus called them, the Essenes. And Isaiah 40 verse 3 was central to their mission. They wanted to prepare a way for God to return once again to Jerusalem. Because clearly God wasn't in that temple if it's so corrupt. Cleanse the temple of its wickedness. Think about Jesus and the money changers. And once again God reign from Jerusalem. And what's really cool is these are the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. They left behind their religious writings. This is amazing. I mean, this is the greatest archaeological find of the 20th century, and you are able to see them today. So if you go there today, the place is called Qumran. Q-U-M-R-A-N. Qumran. And the cave that you see there in the center, that's cave number four. A huge number of writings were found there. Okay, now if we go back to our map, where's Qumran? Okay, well, here's Jerusalem. This is Jericho that I had mentioned earlier. And Isaiah said, go into the wilderness to prepare the way. They said, okay, let's go in the wilderness. Can't go to Jericho because there's a bunch of priests there and they're all, they're all corrupted. So where are we going to go? We went right down here in the wilderness, right next to the Dead Sea. Okay. Here's what it looks like today. It's obviously very dry, rugged. This is not an easy place to live. But they were so committed to the text and preparing a way for God to show up that they committed themselves to be out there. Okay, now, it's interesting to note here, so if we're going to compare the Essenes and Isaiah 43, It's interesting to note that not only did John the Baptist identify himself with Isaiah 43, but so did the Essenes. In fact, since since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, many scholars have said, well, clearly John is influenced by the Essenes. Perhaps he's not completely an Essene, but he's definitely associated or being influenced by them. Because think about it. John the Baptist is a priest. He was born into a priestly family. That's what we learn in Luke 1. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're both from the priestly line of Aaron, which means John the Baptist is a priest. And you find Zechariah, he's performing his duties in the temple. And the Essenes were priests, and they were priests who rejected those ruling at the temple, the corruption. And they said, no, we're going to go out and separate ourselves in the desert. And maybe Zechariah and Elizabeth were like, yay, we don't want... 
John growing up around these these Sadducees that are corrupt and and then the ruling party in the temple. So they send him out to the wilderness for boarding school. Now, we don't know for sure, but it certainly is intriguing when you become familiar with the Essenes and you see the similarities. Now, I'm going to have, I'm going to read one thing from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is something, it comes from a writing that, that scholars call the community rule. These were the guidelines when you're entering the community of believers that went out into the desert, okay? So it's community rule. 1QS is just how you designate um, where they found it and in Qumran. And so it says this, when these become the community in Israel, now, when these, those joining the uh, Essene group, they shall separate themselves from the session of the men of deceit. Now, of course, those are the priests. Not too happy they are with those priests in the temple. Why are we separating ourselves? In order to depart into the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. There we go. Now they're going to quote, as it is written, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And so they went out and they said, we're going to make a way for God to come back into Jerusalem. How do you do it? by studying the Bible. And they were committed. And the reason we have copies of Isaiah and copies of all of these Old Testament texts is they were committed to making copies of the Bible and studying the Bible. Now, what I think is interesting here, it says, uh, the study of the Torah, which he commanded through Moses to do, and according to that which the prophets have revealed by his Holy Spirit. Now notice that, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, here's what's really cool, okay? Check this out. Because if we go back to our map, and you say these faithful Jewish priests and others who joined them read their Bible. They did exactly what Isaiah said to do, go into the wilderness, and they endured a difficult living conditions. And they were faithful to their Bible. And they made the copies that we can read today. And here's what blows your mind. When Jesus begins his ministry, where does his baptism take place? Where did Jesus show up? Right there in the Jordan River. It's not a few miles away. They went to the desert to prepare the way for the Lord to return to Jerusalem as king. And lo and behold, what happens? The Lord shows up to become king in Jerusalem. They did prepare the way of the Lord. And they helped prepare the hearts and the minds of many in Israel by pointing out the corruption in the temple. It's remarkable, folks. So, there's a larger context that we have to know that John is speaking into. How God is going to return to Jerusalem to reign as the king. This is what gospel means. This is what good news means. It's not just, hey, your sins are, Jesus died for your sins, so one day you can, get to, you can get to go to heaven someday and not go to hell. That's not the good news. That's the truncated, we've shrunken the good news. The good news is that God's reign is present right now, so enter the kingdom of God. Now, your sins must be forgiven. Why? Well, because we're exiled. So, Adam and Eve, they're in the the garden. They sin. They're exiled from the garden. And so to get back in the garden, you're going to need forgiveness. Israel, they sinned. They're exiled to Babylon because of their sin. So if you're in exile, what happens? You got to come to get back in the kingdom. Your sins have to be forgiven. We are in exile from the presence of God. Why? Because of our sin. So The forgiveness of sin does play a role, but it's not the main point of the gospel. So in order to come back into the presence of God, into that kingdom that is reigning right now, yes, there's repentance, there's forgiveness of sins, 
there's the restoration of the relationship. But once that's done, now you're called to be a kingdom person, to live like you're in the kingdom of God. Pick up your cross right now and live presently in the kingdom of God. And oh, by the way, the kingdom of God is still reigning through his son, Jesus, the Christ. So this is the message that John is telling us. He is leading the way. He's breaking open the kingdom so that we can, all of us, can enter the kingdom. But we have to have ears to hear what John is telling us.